We're saying that repentance is an obligation. Repentance for every sin, be it minor or major, regardless the nature of that sin, is an obligation upon one of moral capacity. And we know moral capacity means somebody that is uh, uh, pubescent and of sound mind. That's what establishes moral capacity. Basically, it means they're, they're morally responsible and obliged. And this obligation must be discharged immediately. So once the sin is committed, it's an obligation for you then to repent from that sin. To return back to righteousness. And it is accepted for everything, meaning any sin that is committed. If you repent, and there are conditions to that repentance we'll talk about shortly, it will be accepted. With the exception of associating partners with Allah. So a person that associates partners, meaning they worship others besides Allah or along with Allah, etc., they fall into shirk, then as long as they're a mushrik, their repentance is not accepted. Now, if they were to embrace <coughs> Islam, as was discussed previously, then that would serve as an expiation for their, their evil deeds, their past sins. And while they are a believer, then their repentance will be accepted. But at this believer, the repentance is not accepted. So this is a legal obligation, meaning it's not one that's rationally um, determined. Repentance of the polytheist and disbeliever is not accepted until they embrace Islam. It is not publicly accepted. Okay, so there's two issues here. One is your repentance uh, to absolve yourself of sin with Allah. And then there is a repentance that's made um, to absolve yourself from the wrong and the harm that you've caused others. Okay, so he says, or for the nature of the deed that's done. It's not publicly accepted, meaning the repentance is not accepted as it pertains to worldly application. We're not talking about Allah now, we're talking about how we judge one another, um, such as staying their execution. And so all the rulings of Islam still apply. As for their repentance in the hereafter, if it was sincere, it is likely to avail them. Right? So if somebody goes and commits a major crime, and that crime has a penalty, you're not going to get away with the crime by repenting, meaning how it's dealt with in this life. Right? There's a crime, if there's a punishment, the punishment will be carried out unless there is some, some concession or some leeway which legally allows the person to be um, you know, forgiven and pardoned. Otherwise, you can't go kill someone. Say, "Oh, I repented," so you know, you can stay my execution. I've returned to Allah. I'm a God-fearing man now. I won't do it again. Now, there are obviously in that case some options which would pardon the person in terms of their execution. But if they weren't, then their repentance alone uh, will not suffice them. He says it is not publicly accepted in that context from a caller to a misguiding innovation this is somebody that is preaching and teaching uh, innovation which leads others astray leads them away from Allah this is according to a narration from the great Imam Ahmed that which appears to be the official position of this particular school however is that the repentance of an innovator who has disbelieved due to his innovation, even if he invites others to it, is acceptable. So here, my, my comment to the Imam's um, position does not detract from the Imam whatsoever. The Imam here is saying that the open caller to a misguiding innovation is not forgiven publicly, is in contradiction to what the Medhab has established as the official position. So. Basically what that means is that in the various madhahib, the various schools of thought, there is kind of an official established position. And then for the same particular issue, there may be a secondary ruling or narration. So, for example, they may say, no, it's not accepted. Whereas here, um, which is what he says here, whereas the official position in this particular issue is that, yes, they could be pardoned and they could be forgiven in terms of how they are dealt with in uh, the world. The next type, he says, a sorcerer. So long as he disbelieved due to his sorcery, 
like one who claims to be in a discourse with the stars, etc. And we see that today where people are reading your fortune or something and they're using the uh, astrology, not astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the celestial bodies. Astrology being employing the stars for some type of, you know, some type of information or some type of um, whatever. Sorcery here is what we would call it. That's number two. Number three is a hypocrite. A person who proclaim, proclaims Islam but truly denies it inwardly. That's what a hypocrite is. Someone that says they're Muslim but really inside they're not. One who repeatedly apostates. They repeatedly apostate. And we talked about apostasy in the last session. <laughs> so basically, publicly, there are apostasy, apostasy laws. Okay, And if you are found guilty of apostasy, and there's a procedure that you have to go through in the legal system in order to be deemed guilty of that, then we all know what the end result of that is. So a person is, is asked, they're almost coerced in a way, close to being coerced, if you will, in order to um, embrace Islam or to, to turn away from their apostasy and accept, embrace Islam again. So if they do, ala barakatillah. No problem, you've come back to Islam, you're free to go, no harm, no foul. But if they do it repeatedly, we have an issue, okay? And so, uh, repeatedly here means a minimum of two times. Some opined it was three or more. Great Imam al-Bahuti, who was an authority in the school, says two times is a repetition of apostasy. So, if they repeat it, then look, that's it, you don't get a pass. Every time you go in apostate, you're not going to be, you're not going to be looked over simply because you say, "Oh, no, I made a mistake. I've come back. I've changed my ways." No, you, it's not a game. Islam faith is not a game. Okay. It says, or whoever, or one who either curses, in a very obvious and straightforward manner, Allah or His Messenger. Cursing Allah and His Messenger in a very obvious, straightforward manner. It's not something that is tolerable within the Islamic law. Their repentance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is up to Allah, but how we rule and judge is that it's not tolerated. The repentant are not to be called wrongdoers or transgressors. So if someone lived a life of sin and then they repented, we cannot continue to hold them to account, to take them to task continuously call them sinners, evildoers, you know, uh, wrongdoers, transgressors. Maybe they just changed their ways and now they're living a new life, leading a new life. They turned over a new leaf, if you will. And so now they've become God-fearing, pious people. We don't come after them, calling them the sinners that they used to be, reminding them it's, kind, it's, a, kind of, it's a kind of libel, if you will. So that's not permissible. Uh, the next section says the reality and conditions of repentance. So here it, meaning repentance, uh, which linguistically means to return. Toba, it means to return. We all know the word toba. That means to return, like someone returning to Allah after sinning. When you sin, it means you turn away from Allah. When you commit a sin, you've turned away from Allah and you've turned towards something else. You've turned towards that sin. You've turned towards the desires to commit that sin. And so when you make toba, make that you turn back to Allah so you turn back and Toba is regret for the sin for the sake of Allah the Most High and not for the sake of some worldly benefit or due to people's harassment right, so a major part of Toba is regret it's remorse that when you commit a sin you feel regret and you feel remorse it says it's requisite so now we're talking about the basically the conditions of repentance is the resolution to avoid committing a potential sin and to restore or replace the injustice from which repentance is sought to the deserving, the determination to do so if not possible, and to do so by choice. So here are a couple of issues regarding repentance. So number one is um, that you are resolved to abandon that sin. You're going to stop sinning. All right, so you have remorse. You're going to stop sinning. That doesn't mean if you commit the sin again, you know, your repentance is invalid. No, 
it means that you have to be remorseful and you have to be resolved that you're going to stop. Now, of course, you may slip up in the future. Right? But the intention is I'm not going to go commit it again. Because if you're saying, oh, I've, I'm, I'm, oh, Allah, forgive me, in your heart, like in five minutes, I'm just going to do it again. It's playing. It's, a, it's playing around. And we, we're not playing around when it comes to repentance with Allah subhanahu. Um, after that is uh, to restore or replace an injustice from which repentance is sought. So basically, if you wrong someone and that's a sin, then you should restore that right. If you steal something, then you should return what you stole. Okay? Um, and if you're unable to do it, the determination to do so is not possible. Meaning, if you can't give it back for whatever reason, maybe you spent it and now you have to replace it, you don't have the money to do so, you should be determined to do that. Say, look, I stole $500. I ended up spending all of that money. I don't have the money to return, but I'm going to work until I get it. And once I get it, I'm going to give it to you. As opposed to going, I don't have it. Oh, well, I'm not even going to try to give it back. Now, you have to be determined to return and restore that right in order for the repentance to be accepted. And also to do so by choice, meaning that you're doing this because you want to do it, not because you're coerced to do it. It says, it is not a requisite to seek pardon of another due to backbiting, etc. And this is according to the official position of the school. So from time to time, we may find ourselves guilty of backbiting someone. Backbiting is mentioning someone in a manner that they dislike in their absence. That's what backbiting is. Mentioning someone in a manner they dislike in their absence. So a person is... Um, I don't know, uh, a bad driver, for example. And you are running them down by talking about their bad driving while they're not there. And they would not like that you did that. Or you were talking about some uh, rude behavior or sinful behavior. They would not like you to talk about them in that way. That's backbiting and that's sinful. So um, there are some opinions that say that if you backbite someone, then in order for your repentance to be valid, from that backbiting, you have to go and seek their forgiveness. Listen, I said this about you, I'm very sorry, especially if they found out about it. The school here, the, the school of Imam Ahmed, the official position is that it's not a condition of repentance from such sins like backbiting. It's not a, repent, it's not a condition to seek forgiveness from the victim or inform them of what was said. You don't have to go saying it. You know, it may be even worse. You backbite somebody, they don't hear about it. And then you go to them and you say it. Guess what I said about you? Well, then now you probably may have damaged the relationship that could be uh, preserved. I said you were a terrible driver and that you, you know, you use foul language and you're a cheat and you're sneaky and whatever. The person may go, well, I didn't know you felt so strongly about me. Our friendship's over. And I'm not going to forgive you for that. So now what are you going to do? So it's not a condition. Uh, and so it's interesting here in the textbook um, that Imam al Badbat, you remember the textbook is the golden pendant. And this is a summary by Ibn Balban. He summarized a much larger work by Ibn Hamdan. So you have Ibn Balban and you have Ibn Hamdan. Ibn Hamdan is the one that wrote the larger work. And so Ibn Balban, he came and summarized. Now, typically, summaries would just be. You just take the, the meat and you trim the fat. And he did that. But on the occasion, he would change things. And here is one example in which he changed what Ibn Hamdan wrote. He didn't change it. He basically put in what he viewed to be most correct. See, Ibn Hamdan was of the opinion that you have to seek the forgiveness of the person that was the victim of your backbiting if they were aware that you did it, that you had to go to them and seek their pardon. That was the opinion of the original author. And this is a secondary opinion found in the school, as I tried to highlight before. You'll find that there's a variance of rulings on one particular issue, even within a single school of law. It says, it is valid for, from some sins and not others, as we know. You can repent from most sins, some sins like the unforgivable sin of disbelief or shirk, says whoever is ignorant of their sin should repent from every sin in general and from those they know of specifically. So there may be sins that we don't know we've committed. 
um, we were oblivious to them. Or we committed them and then we forgot about them. And we know, look, look, I know I made some mistakes in my life. I know I have done wrong. And in this case, what do you do? You want to make a, a, a broad statement or a broad uh, repentance. Oh, Allah, forgive me of all my sins, the sins that I have forgotten about, the sins that are unknown, etc., etc. And the ones that you can remember, then you should ask for Allah to forgive you of those sins specifically. When I said this or when I did that, forgive me of the, the, um, the misgivings and misdeeds. It says acceptance of repentance is a favor from Allah. Allah is within his right to reject the repentance of his servants. Allah has the right and the authority to reject and turn your repentance down. It is not your right to be forgiven simply because you repent. That's because Allah is mighty and majestic. Allah is supreme. Allah is above his creature, creatures. Allah is, is not accountable to anyone, but we are accountable to him. And he mentions this here because there were some groups that held this view. If you seek repentance, Allah is obliged to pardon you. And this, of course, is a misunderstanding. He says, its manner, the manner of repentance, is I am repentant to Allah for such and such. This is basically how you seek repentance. I am repentant to Allah for such and such, meaning this sin or that sin. Or I seek forgiveness from Allah from it. I seek forgiveness from Allah from backbiting or from, uh, you know, whatever. He says, it is obligatory that either of the two phrases be employed or something like them. He's basically saying, Ibn al-Balban, that you have to use this wording. This one or the other one. There's two different wordings that he mentions here. Um, this, however, is a point of contention among the school's major scholars. Some of the major authorities like Ibn Mufleh, Safarin, and Bahuti, these are major players in the madhab, they have said um, otherwise, that you don't have to use this particular wording. You can ask for Allah's forgiveness in any way. The next uh, section, and this is where we're going to conclude for the evening, Hanbali issues pertaining to repentance. All right, so these are some particular rulings here. It says, whoever does not regret committing a punishable sin. This is a sin that has a legal punishment, a legal penalty. The punishment alone is not repentance. Okay? What that means is, if you commit a punishable sin, a sin which bears a penalty, the penalty in and of itself does not absolve you of that sin with Allah. It will, it will serve as an expiation for the wrongs committed in this life. But it will not absolve you of the guilt of committing the sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically it means that if you're going to be punished with the penalty of this world, you're still obliged to repent. You're still obliged to be remorseful. You can't go, well, I stole, I don't really care. I cut off my hand, my debt's cleared. And it's clear with Allah. No. Because you're not remorseful, it means that you are musir. You are a continuous sinner. The person that's not remorseful of their sin is a continuous sinner. They're going to do it again. They're going to continue to do that again. It says repentance is valid from an amputee for stealing, a eunuch for illegal fornication. You understand? A eunuch is like one who's He's a severed organ. Yeah, so it's not a possibility uh, to for illegal fornication. One with a severed tongue for libel. Right? So you can't even speak to commit libel or backbiting, etc. And of course, this is in reference to someone who committed such crimes previously. That they can repent even though they don't have the tools to sin. Or someone who is who is intending to do so if they could. Like they have it in their heart that, you know what, if I could do it, I would commit it. If I could do it, I would commit it. And they can seek repentance from that intention, right? Even if they can't do it, they can still seek repentance and it will be accepted and valid. It says it is accepted so long as the angel of death has not selected the repentant. Your repentance is valid so long as the angel of death has not selected you. Meaning so long as the soul has not left the body, so long as they're still morally responsible or they still have their wit about them. These are three different opinions. 
So what that means, they all basically mean the same thing. It's, so long as you're still alive and in good working order mentally, then your repentance is, is accepted. If it's at the moment of your death, then the soul has left the body, it's over. Right? So you have this opportunity now, and that's why we're saying it's an obligation to seek repentance immediately. It should not be put off. You should not be delaying repentance because once you die, that's it. Let's go Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our sins. Those that we know and those that we do not. It says it is valid for one who has transgressed their repentance so long as they are not determined to repeat the same sin. Basically what that means uh, is a person who has basically committed the same sin that they repented from. So long as they're not determined to repeat it again. Basically you committed the same sin again but now you're saying that's it I'm done. I can't do this again this is terrible. You see, you transgressed your previous repentance. You, you asked Allah to forgive you for uh, backbiting, for example. And then you were guilty of backbiting again. All right? And you seek repentance from that. As long as you were remorseful from the first and you're remorseful for the second, it's valid. And like that is the story of man. We find ourselves continuously making the same type of mistakes, unfortunately. It says, whoever knowingly neglects the obligatory repentance while capable of doing so once must repent for neglecting repentance that time that means that it's like a double whammy you know you commit a sin you're obliged to repent because you're obliged that's a moral obligation what happens when you don't do your obligations what you're obliged to fast what happens when you don't fast what is it a sin or not it's a sin you're obliged to repent you say I'm not repenting what happens it's a sin so you're sinful for the sin that you committed and then for neglecting the obligatory repentance you're sinful for that so you have to seek repentance for not repenting and if you have to seek repentance for the sin that you committed then you have to seek repentance for not repenting say I wasn't I wasn't repentant I didn't care okay he says, as alluded to previously, none of those who face the Qibla disbelieve by sin. This is key. Because we're dealing with this particular issue around the world today. And a lot of what, what this topic has to do with is what we find where Muslims kill other Muslims. And acts of terror and hate. As alluded to previously, none of those who face the Qibla disbelieve by sin. Those that face the Qibla are Muslims, they pray. They face the Qibla in prayer, a person that prays is a believer. So they're not um, to be deemed disbelievers because of sins they commit. Even if they commit major sins, we do not declare the faithful disbelievers due to sins even if they do not repent. So we find someone that, that is committing major sins and they're not repentant either. We just consider them sinners. These are evildoers. We don't say these are not Muslims. Okay, we're not going to um, expel them from Islam because of the sins they commit. So they are resigned to the will and forgiveness of Allah due to the belief that the foundation of their faith will save them from eternity in the fire, even if they did not perform an ounce of good. They have a mustard seed of Iman in their heart. They have something in their heart of faith, then it's likely that you know Allah will pardon them. Allah may punish them. But because of that faith, he will not um, he will not sentence them to an eternity in hellfire because of that faith. And so that means they're still believers. They're still believers. So as long as they do not permit an obvious ruling, which by consensus is impermissible, or deny an obvious ruling, which by consensus is permissible. And basically what that means, and we conclude here, is that the only time you would take somebody outside of Islam obviously unless they committed some major type of disbelief which expelled them from Islam, is if they started to deem the impermissible permissible knowingly. Or to deem the permissible impermissible knowingly. They know, for example, the, those that denied zakat. They denied the zakat. They said zakat's no longer an obligation after the prophet passed away. And so they refused to pay it. And so what happened? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he had to go and he had to face, uh, face off with them. They denied a pillar of Islam, something that's obviously 
an obligation, they were saying it's no longer an obligation. Or imagine a haram. Someone says, no, nope, pork is permissible. That ruling is outdated. It's antiquated. It's not applicable anymore. And I understand that Allah says we don't eat it. It's nejis. It's, it's filth. But today, science says it's fine. And therefore, it's permissible for us. In fact, from 1975 onward, when they started giving, and I'm making that up, when they started giving them injections and all this stuff and everything, from that point onward, it was halal. And that's why it's okay to consume all these pork products. No. In that case, you know, there is a process that a person has to go through, of course, in the legal system. And if they are found, um, you know, adamant about this, then that would expel them from Islam. Because now what they're doing is they're denying Allah's legislation. To deny a part of it is paramount to denying its entirety. And with that, I thank you for your attentive listening and your patience. And uh, we'll wrap it up here. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam.